Mike, thanks for coming from the Keys. Yep. <clears throat> All right, guys. Again, before we even get started, a big hand to the entire Chaos crew. These guys spent a lot of time getting this entire event ready. It doesn't happen on its own. Okay, I was here this afternoon at 12 o'clock and they were already preparing the entire team. So really a big thank you from all of us. You, you don't know what a difference this makes in all of our lives here. So once again, thank you. Okay. A lot of familiar faces for those of you that I've never seen before. My name is Captain Mike. I'm the founder of Florida Sport Fishing Magazine and the host of Florida Sport Fishing TV, and I love to fish. Okay, my job in life is to educate anglers. That's my goal, is I wanna share as much information with you as I possibly can to make you more successful anglers. I'm not saying my way is the best way, because if something is working for you, by all means, stick with it and share it with me because I want to catch more as well. However, my way is proven. I spend a lot of time researching, developing different tactics, and I like to share everything that I come up with, the good and the bad, because it's not always good. And remember that sometimes going out fishing and not catching anything or fishing particular spots where you don't find what you're looking for is just as important as finding what you're looking for. Okay, all of the information is important. So we've got a really cool topic tonight about wahoo fishing. Okay, wahoo are an extraordinary game fish. Number one, they grow incredibly fast, very similar to dolphin. Your average wahoo will grow an average of two pounds per month. Okay, so think about that. A 20 to 25 pound wahoo is a year, a little bit over a year old. He's a baby, okay? Very rarely will you see a wahoo over five years old. They only have a maximum lifespan of five to six years, and that's a giant. That's a triple digit wahoo. And we all know those don't come too easy. Anybody here ever catch a wahoo over 100 pounds? Nobody, okay? <laughs> Including me. <laughs> Not yet, okay? Um, so an incredible game fish. They look incredible like a missile. A lot of people call them zebras or cheetahs of the sea. They have fascinating coloration and bars. Okay, they're so streamlined, so incredibly fast. It's many people believe that wahoo are the fastest fish in the ocean. Truth of the matter is that's incorrect. Anybody know the fastest fish in the ocean? Sailfish. sailfish. Short bursts, a sailfish can outrun a wahoo. However, wahoo are incredibly fast, okay? Uh, easily can attain bursts of speeds exceeding 50 miles an hour. So that is just an amazing predator. Because they burn so much energy, they also have to refuel a lot. So they have to eat a lot in order to refuel all of that energy that they're burning. They're constantly on the move. A wahoo is not like a mutton snapper or a grouper that just lays there hovering, okay, waiting for food to come to it. It is always moving. It's constantly on the move, constantly looking for predatory opportunities to feed. Really extraordinary fish. They're not a schooling fish per se, like a dolphin. You're not gonna find a hundred wahoo stacked up next to each other like cordwood. But if there's a good feeding opportunity around, you will see loose congregations. It's not uncommon to have a pack of wahoo in the same area because they're all there for the same reason, to eat, okay? And if the food is there, they will be there. But again, not really a schooling fish. They are caught around the entire state of Florida. It's you know, one of the game fish that you can target around the entire state of Florida. The primary depth where we target Wahoo is generally 130 to 230 feet. That 100 foot span, 130 to 230, is really where you're gonna find 95 to 98% of the big Wahoo that are caught. Now, well offshore, if you stumble across a weed line, floating debris, a raft, anything, it's not uncommon to catch Wahoo offshore, but they're generally smaller. We call them Weehoos. Really cute, right? They're like this big. They're a few months old, okay? That's all that they really are. And those small Weehoos, okay, it isn't uncommon to catch 10. Okay, they will school. They're small, they're stupid, they don't know what's what. Okay, they just haven't reached maturity yet. Once they reach a year old, those fish are mature. They will start to spawn anywhere from 500,000 to 40 million eggs. 
okay, to try and reproduce themselves. So very prolific. And they will, like I said, roam and roam and roam and eat and eat and eat, you know, constantly because they're growing so fast. The average wahoo that we see is typically 20 to 40 pounds. I think everybody will agree that's the average size fish. You know, this big, how big was that wahoo? Oh, he was 38 pounds. He was probably 26. Okay, but either way, 20 to 40 pounds is the average. 40 to 60 pounds is a really, really nice fish. Once you hit that 50 pound mark, right, that's like a threshold. That's a really, really nice wahoo. Every year, there are a number of fish that are taken that are in the 60 to 80 pound range giants. And then, of course, there's these select fish, 80 to 100 pounds. We don't see a lot of them here. However, certainly every year, a number of triple-digit fish are caught in the Bahamas, even here, one here, one there, in the Keys, one here, one there, certainly way out in the Gulf, one here, one there. It is a fish that you can target with a number of different approaches. Kite fishing, you can go out kite fishing. Very rarely do guys specifically say, hey, I'm gonna go kite fishing specifically for Wahoo. No, I'm gonna go kite fishing and I may catch a Wahoo, incidentally, because he's gonna be in that same area where I'm targeting king mackerel, dolphin, and sailfish, and there may be Wahoo there as well. And then of course there's trolling planers with strip baits, which is incredibly popular here in this, in this area which all of the charter boats do day in and day out. Very, very popular, very effective at catching a wide variety of species, including the wahoo, okay? And then there's the mindset where I'm not trying to catch anything that I can. I'm specifically trying to catch wahoo, so what am I gonna do? Fast. Fast, high speed troll, right? High speed troll, that's what I'm gonna do because I specifically want to catch that wahoo. What is the definition of high-speed trolling? Well, up until recently, we're going to go out there and we're going to fish anywhere from two to four lines with trolling leads that could range anywhere from 12 ounces all the way on up to 48 ounces. That trolling lead has approximately a 25 to 30 foot shot cord, which is then connected to a high-speed bullet-shaped type of lure. We're gonna stagger those behind the boat if we're fishing four rods. Again, the lightest weight is gonna be the furthest back. The heaviest weight is gonna be closest to the boat. And we're gonna troll at a high rate of speed ranging from 14 to 18 knots. Very, very common, incredibly effective, very effective, and a staple. Not only here, but certainly in the Bahamas. Everybody that's running over to the Bahamas is high speed trolling for Wahoo. Okay, because number one, it helps avoid all of the barracudas that will hit baits that are trolled slower. You're covering a lot of ground and you're not gonna outrun that wahoo. Remember, that fish can go 50 miles an hour. You going 18 miles an hour is not too fast. As a matter of fact, there are lures that are designed to allow you to troll at 25 knots if you wanted to. You're not gonna outrun the fish. Again, very effective. The latest and greatest technique is guys are doing this with the electric reels, the hooker electric reels or the LPs, the Lingren Pittmans. You want to see somebody who's tricked out look at a 39 foot center console with four LPs. Okay, This guy's got $40,000 in rods and reels to troll for Wahoo. He gets a fish on and he pushes a button and it brings the fish to the boat. I'm not too into that. I got to be honest with you. I believe that the electric reels, when it comes to certain applications, are absolutely necessary. Daytime sword fishing, because I'm not cranking 12 pounds of lead off the bottom 1,800 feet down, right? It just doesn't make sense. However, when you're wahoo fishing, the whole electric thing, you know, to me, leaves something to be desired, but it is happening. Getting back to it, that has been a really effective tactic, and it continues to be a really effective tactic. Personally, I moved down to Florida, gosh, how long ago? Long, long time ago. To this area 25 years ago. I've been fishing out of Pompano for 25 years. And when I first moved here and fishing out of Hillsboro, I wanted to catch Wahoo because it's a Wahoo. It's so glamorous, right? It's probably the most glamorous fish. You know, dolphin, you can go out, you need to load the boat with dolphin to raise anybody's even eyebrow. 
that fish better be 30 to 50 pounds before anybody even gets excited. However, you come back to the dock with one 30 pound Wahoo and suddenly you're a god. Okay, it's like people just love Wahoo. And for many good reasons, like I said, they're beautiful fish, they're hard to find, hard to catch, they're challenging, they're great fighters, they're so fast, and even more importantly, or equally as important, they absolutely taste great, right? I don't care how you cook them, blackened, fried, grilled, sashimi, don't cook it at all, okay? And it is absolutely awesome. One of my favorite, you know, game fish to eat, no question. But because they are so good to eat, and I just kind of want to throw this in there, not too many people are willing to tag Wahoo and let them go. And then, you know, so there hasn't been a lot of studies with Wahoo to see where they go, where they migrate, how fast they grow, but there has been some. Nevertheless, let me get back on track with the high speeding. I came down fishing out of here 25 years ago, started to get into Wahoo fishing, took me many years to get dialed in. I lost a lot of tackle and caught almost nothing for the first many, many times that I went out there and tried. I remember one time in particular having a spread of four lines, four, you know, trolling leads, lures, and here comes one of boat, you know, one of the charter boats. I hate to use which one, they're still operation. Uh -uh. <clears throat> four letters starts with B, ends with L. Anyway. <laughs> Comes right across, I don't know if the guy doesn't see me, this is many years ago, but cuts off all four of my lines. And I'm like, "Really? seriously, did that just really happen? So in turn, you know, I've lost a lot of tackle before I got dialed in, but I did eventually get dialed in and I was catching some fish. Well, a couple of years ago, I relocated from this area down to Marathon in the Florida Keys. Different world altogether, by the way. And of course, being an avid Wahoo fisherman, I want to get in on the Wahoo bite down there in the Keys. So I go out and I use the same tactics that I've done here with the trolling leads, thinking, well, of course, this is how you catch them. This is how everybody catches them everywhere. So I go out, put out the trolling leads, put out the spread, and I catch a fish. And then I catch another fish. And you know, as these trips progress, I'm having pretty decent success. I'm not catching fish on every trip, but I've got a good average, okay? And understand when I say per trip, because I'm gonna talk a lot about this throughout the seminar. Where I am in Marathon, to get to the pass where I enter the ocean is about five minutes. From the pass to get out to 150 feet is nine minutes, okay? So I will get up very early at the crack of dawn, even before that, and I'll run out to that 150 edge and I'll fish for two hours by myself. Okay, because it's hard, you know, everybody says, who wants to come fishing with me in the Keys? Everybody, right? But if I said to you, hey, get in your car, drive three hours to my house at two in the morning, and then we're going to leave and we're going to fish for two hours, and then we're going to come home and you're going to drive three hours home. It's hard to say that to people. So you learn to go out and do things on your own, and not because you're forced to, but because you want to, because I want to learn the area, I want to learn the fisheries, and I really want to get dialed in. And really by 9 a.m., I got to be back at work, I got to be in the office filming, editing, giving this guy content, doing all kinds of stuff, selling ads, you know, all sorts of stuff. So I'll go out, I'll give it a couple hours. I've trolled for 20 to 30 miles during, you know, with the high speeding at approximately 14, 15 knots, you know, that's a lot of ground that I'm covering. And if I don't catch fish by 9 a.m., there are no Wahoo around. And if I do catch fish, then I'm going to catch them by 9 a.m. Nevertheless, I found it to be incredibly troublesome fishing with the trolling leads, especially when you're by yourself and even when you're not by yourself. Why? Why? What are the problems? Well, number one, you've got this long leader coming from the trolling lead to the lure. And generally, once that trolling lead, you know, which could be up to 48 ounces, approaches the boat, you've got to leader the fish to remaining 25 to 30 feet, hand over hand, and somebody's got to gaff them and get the fish in the boat. You still have other lines behind the boat. Your boat's still moving forward at a high rate of speed because you have anywhere from one to three other lines still behind the boat, right? And if you're by yourself, holy moly, what a nightmare it can be. And I've had some nightmares, trust me when I tell you. It's dangerous, 
you know, it could be really troublesome, but it's an incredibly effective tactic. I'm not gonna take that away, all right? And it's something where if you're having success doing that, maybe you should continue to do that. But I woke up one morning and said, there's gotta be a better way. There has to be a better way, okay? Especially for guys, not only who are fishing alone, but who don't wanna make the investment in all of that sort of tackle, who don't wanna get their hands dirty with all of that, because it's a science, it's a lot of work. Anybody that's done this before, that's gone high-speed wahoo fishing knows it's not easy. You know, there's a lot of gear involved, you've got long leaders, you've gotta gaff this fish. You know, you're, you're hand lining a 50 pound wahoo and that line, that 25 to 30 feet of line is somewhere either back in the water or laying on the deck, a lot could go wrong, okay? I've seen guys, the most experienced guys, don't ask me why they do this, I'll never understand this. Well, actually I know why. But when they go to gaff a wahoo, high speeding, they step over the transom onto the back engine platform, right? You guys know what I'm talking about? And they're back there trying to gaff the fish so this way, they, their belief, so he doesn't get wrapped up in the propellers because we're gonna gaff him back here. How dangerous is that? There was just a guy on one of the two conks boats in the Keys, he did the same thing, went to gaff the Wahoo and went thoop, right in the water. By himself, the only crew member on the boat, customers, had to grab the wheel, turn around and get him, okay? I'm like, why are you getting out of your 36 yellow fin? What are you doing? You know, I've got a 39 CV, I'm not getting out of that boat. It's big enough, I'm staying in the boat. If you don't want him to get wrapped up in your motors, turn the wheel to the right a little bit and there he is. You know, there's other ways around it. Point I'm making, it's just not easy, right? And there are good sides to it because it is productive, but there's also a lot of bad sides. So I decide I wanna come up with a better way. Trolling plugs are nothing new, right? Trolling plugs have been in use offshore for decades, probably longer than I've been alive. And for many, many years, the go-to plugs have been things like the Rapala. Remember the old Rapalas with the metal bill? Okay, they're still really, really effective. I forget what that model is called. What is it? The CD-18, okay? And then, of course, there's the X-Raps, and MANS has some deep diving plugs, and HALCO has some deep diving plugs, and there's a variety of them. And over the years, I've trolled them too, and I've caught some fish. But I trolled them where I took one deep diving plug and put it in my spread while I was dolphin fishing, right? I've got lures up on top, and then to cover more of the water column, I would throw a deep diver right down the middle. And I'd pick off dolphin, I'd pick off wahoo, for sure, very, very effective. But my mindset is, was not and, and is not to try and catch as much as I possibly can with a variety of species. No, when I'm going out there wahoo fishing, I am wahoo fishing. I'm very, very focused. I bring four rods right here. I do not bring any other equipment on the boat. You know why? Because it's very easy. When things don't go your way, when you're attempting to do something, ah, you know what, they're not biting, let me go do this. Oh, you know, I didn't get a bite in an hour, let me go do this. Oh, you know, I got some, there's a lot of grass around, let me go do this. No, I don't want that. I want to face those challenges, and, I, and I've wanted that and continue to face those challenges because it teaches you how to overcome those challenges because you have two choices. Overcome the challenge and continue to fish or go home. It's, it, that's the bottom line because you're not going yellowtail fishing with this, okay? It's not happening. So in turn, I'm very, very focused, and that's very important. If you want to be a more successful wahoo fisherman, be, get focused, get dialed in. Don't bring all of your stuff and say, hey, I'm gonna give this a little while, you know, because yeah, I'm not saying you're not gonna improve your game and you're not gonna catch fish, but you're really not gonna become sensei or a master at it, okay? And in order to do that, you've gotta really be focused. Wahoo fishing is one of those things that you get out of it what you put into it. I'm willing to put a tremendous amount into it. I've done it and I continue to do it. For me, going out in the morning and spending two or three hours wahoo fishing and catching nothing, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that because every single trip, I'm learning something new and I'm going, oh, you know, now I get it. And understand, I'm not only targeting wahoo because you know what else I'm doing? I'm constantly, constantly looking at my Furuno TZ Touch 
multifunction displays. I've got a PBG, which is called a personal bathymetric generator. Anybody see more maps? We're all familiar with it. Well, Furuno now has a new feature where I can map the bottom as I'm trolling. So I'm trolling, but I'm also mapping the bottom. On this screen, I'm looking at my sonar, my fish finder for any sort of structure. Wrecks, reefs, ledges, every time I find anything, I just touch it right on the fish finder and it creates a waypoint for me to come back and investigate. So I'm wahoo fishing in 150 to 250, but I'm also mapping the bottom and looking for structure for mutton snapper fishing at the same time. So I've got multi-purpose kind of fishing, okay? So I'm accomplishing a lot even if I don't catch that wahoo. Now, it's easy to go out and troll one bait, right? But to go out and troll four lines by yourself and do it successfully and come home on nine occasions straight with two fish every single time, that says something. And if you've been following my Instagram page, if not, you should, it's at Florida Sport Fishing TV. You'll see that in September and October, I had a streak of 13 trips in a row bagging at least one fish, 13 trips in a row. And again, remember, my trip is over at 9 a.m., okay? I'm out there very early. I have baits in the water before the sun is over the horizon. And as a matter of fact, we just aired a Wahoo show using this tactic where it was pitch black like this. We set the baits, people were like, how can, the fish can't see that lure in the dark. I'm like, of course they can. Yes, they can. We set the baits, I went up to the helm, and in 90 seconds, the rod started singing and we had a nice 40 pound fish in the boat, in the dark. They could see these baits, okay? They're, they're hunters, this is what they do for a living. And even though you don't see that false light, they can, they can maximize on that light, okay? They're not amazing predators for no reason. So you've gotta be willing to lose some sleep, that's number one. Number two, you've gotta be willing to commit, okay? Be focused, and you know what? If you don't catch something, that's okay. That's okay as long as you learn something, and the next time, your odds of catching them are gonna be greater. And it's the same thing that happened with me. I decided there has to be a better way. I went out, I failed, I failed, a little success. I failed, I failed, I caught one. I failed, I caught one, I caught one. You know what I'm saying? And it just got better and better. So what I'm gonna do, is share exactly, right to the T, what I do. How I do it, why I do it, what the benefits are, what the downsides are, and however you take that information and incorporate it into your own boat and into your own Wahoo fishing, that's completely up to you because we all own a different boat. We all own different tackle. We all go fishing with different people who are at different skill levels, right? Everybody is different and every scenario is different, so I can't, talk for everybody. I can just explain what works for me, how it works, and why I do it through a tremendous amount of trial and error. And trust me, I have failed many times. Make no mistake. You may see all of the pictures of the fish I've caught. You don't see the pictures of the fish I didn't catch, right? Or the, the failures. But again, to me, it's never a failure. It's always a success, no matter what. So first thing I'm going to do, okay, is the tackle. Let's start with that, my tackle in my boat, making sure I am ready. Now understand, the average Wahoo is 20 to 40 pounds, right? I'm not going after the 20 to 40 pounders. I have grander visions. My goal is a giant. My goal is to come home one day and say, I caught a giant Wahoo that was at least 80 to 100 pounds. That's my goal, okay? And I'm gonna go out there every time that I can focused on achieving that goal. Why is that important? If I go out there with inadequate tackle that can handle a 30 pound Wahoo, but that's all it can handle, what's gonna happen when I get that once in a lifetime shot at a 90? <laughs> Game over, how frustrated am I gonna be? So in turn, I go out ready for the beast. I'm going after that monster, okay? And if I catch all of those smaller fish along the way, Great, that's what I'm doing. I'm getting dialed in, I'm learning more and more. My system is getting better and better. You know, just as an example, just one quick example as to what I mean by that. On a recent trip last week, before all this wind, I'm out there, had an absolutely awesome morning. I had five bites by 9 a.m. this morning. I had already put a nice fish in the boat, 30, 35 pounds, and then I hooked a big one. Not giant, easily 50, 
I'm going to guess 50. I get the fish right up next to the boat. I go to reach for the gaff. He shakes his head, and I watch him swim away. I'm heartbroken. But I stop, and I go, you know, and I want you to understand. Remember I said I reach for the gaff. This is the back of my boat. This is the stern of my CV. I keep one gaff on each side, right in the gunnel, because I don't know where I'm going to land that fish. I might come up on this side. What if I come up on this side and my gaff is over there? And I'm holding a rod. There's a 50-pound wahoo. My gaff is on the other side of the boat. What am I supposed to do? The boat's still moving forward, right? I mean, the only option is let me put the rod in the rod holder. Grab, come on, that doesn't make sense. So I've learned I have a gaff on each side, so I'm ready no matter what. But then I said to myself, what's going to happen when that day when I hook that 80-pounder, that 100-pounder, that giant wahoo, and I've got a gaff with a two-inch hook, and I stick them, and now I'm like, I'm supposed to lift this 100-pound wahoo in the boat? Now, you could all laugh. I'm going to catch that 100-pounder. You'll see. And I only have a little two-inch gaff. So I go, you know, now I need a third gaff. I need a third gaff right in the middle. This way, no matter what side I'm on, I could gaff that fish, and I could reach for a third gaff and get two gaps in them. It may sound like a small thing to you where you go, you know, well, first of all, this guy's never going to catch that 80 to 100 pounder, which I will, okay? And number two, the chances of that happening are one in a million. Well, you're right. Hooking that 100 pound wahoo is one in a million, but I'm ready for him and I want to be ready for him. And by, by having that mindset, okay, by understanding all of those little details, it's just going to make me much more successful on all of those smaller fish, right? So, getting back to it, my boat, 39 CV, I'm ready to go wahoo fishing, I'm fueled up, I need about 33 gallons beginning to end in this particular case, I don't need a lot of fuel, I've got my three gaffs ready to go, I need no bait whatsoever, and I've got my four outfits, okay? As you can see, two of them are bent butts, we'll talk about the benefit of each, two of them are straight butts, 60 to 100 pound class chaos rods, Rodzilla's, by the way, if you don't fish chaos rods, you'll never catch any wahoo. I just want to throw that out there, okay? So throw away whatever else you got, walk on over there, throw that credit card on the table, and hook yourself up with some black and gold chaos rods, okay? Reels are matched, or the rods are matched to 30 wide reels. I don't care, Shimano Tiagra is the best in the business. Right now, that's not what you see here, but you will in the near future. Okay, I don't care what brand you use to make sure they've got a nice, smooth drag system and that they can put plenty of drag on the reel. This is no place for cheesy, cheap tackle. Okay, that is not, this is not the place for that because of all of the strain and resistance that you're putting on this equipment, you need some heavy duty gear. So don't go cheesy, don't go light, tackle 20, 30 pound gear. This isn't the place for it. The reels are loaded with 65 pound diamond braid. Not 50, not 80. I have fished 50 and got busted off. I have fished 80 and said, wait a minute, I'm not getting these lures to perform the way I want to. Let me find that balance, and the balance is 65. Remember what I said. I'm sharing with you exactly what I do through trial and error, okay? It's high vis. You could see that line. Really important. Really important. I've got four lines behind the boat. I'm not fishing outriggers. They're not spread out. They're right behind the boat. So I have to be able to easily go one, two, three, four. Okay. And there's no better way to do that than with the high vis. So I don't care if it's orange, white, whatever it is. Make sure you can see that braid. The end of the braid is tied to 25 feet of 150 pound extra hard leader material. Okay, there it is, 150 pound, 25 feet. It is connected to the braid with an Alberto knot. Very small, very streamlined. This is very important that all of your connections are incredibly small and streamlined. Effectively fishing these Nomad plugs is all about the details. So many people say to me, I don't know how you do it. I've been fishing those Nomad plugs, and you know what? I've caught jack shit. Excuse my language. I've caught nothing, okay? It's the details. I'm telling you it's all in the details. And something as simple as a small little knot makes a huge difference. 
Why? Because not only does it create less drag in the water, the chances of grass or weed or this fouling or one of any number of different things occurring are eliminated. So I've learned to eliminate each and every, or I should say I've learned to look at each and every detail and fine tune each and every detail. So the braid to 25 feet of the extra hard leader Alberto knot, okay? The end of the mono leader has nothing, zero. Not a big snap, not anything. So don't tie on a big snap swivel thinking, you know what, this is perfect. I could just open the snap and clip on another lure. No, because that snap is going to create resistance. And that snap is going to create or has a potential to catch grass. And the last thing that I want to do by myself or with anybody on the boat is have to constantly reel in grass, okay? And I don't know because I'm moving at a high rate of speed. I don't know if there's grass on there or not but I know that I'm much more likely to catch weed and grass with a big bulky snap swivel than without it. Am I right? Okay, so streamlined. Now, all of my lures, all of my lures are rigged exactly the same way. I don't care what size Nomad this is, and trust me, I had the bright idea one day of saying, well, my small plugs, I can fish lighter leader. And after I lost, two plugs in a row. I went, no, I can't. So all of my lures are rigged exactly the same way. You have the plug. Right at the plug is a crimp, okay? This is 220 pound test. 220 pound Namoy extra hard leader. There it is. I don't fish wire, I don't fish cable, okay? 220 pound. It is approximately four feet. No more than that. At the end of this is another crimp to a 175 pound ball bearing barrel swivel. Very small, you probably can't even see that from most of the room. Every single lure is rigged exactly the same. I don't care what size it is. Now, when I am ready to fish, I take my 150 from the rod to the top of the barrel swivel and I crimp it. Okay, with a very, very tiny crimp. At the end of the seminar, whenever you'd like, you can come up and see. Okay, it's a very small streamlined connection. Look at, that's my entire connection right there. Very, very streamlined. And I keep sounding like a broken record, and I'm gonna continue to say it. In order to get these lures to perform the way you need them to perform, your connections have to be incredibly streamlined. Now you may be saying, Mike, you're fishing mono and not wire. How many times are you gonna get cut off? And the answer is, you're partially right and you're wrong. So let me explain. This is a DTX 220. It's a Nomad DTX 220. I have never lost a single one of these. The DTX 165, on the other hand, this is a 165, I've lost half a dozen of these. Okay, why? Because the Wahoo can get this entire lure in their mouth. Okay, they cannot get this entire lure in their mouth. In addition to that, after every single fish, I'm feeling that mono. Okay, and if it's chafed, which it is a lot, if there's any chafes at all in that leader, instantly I grab a pair of pliers, I simply cut it right there, hypothetically speaking, right there, I grab another lure, which I bring pre-rigged, ready to go. I grab a crimp and a crimping tool, and I crimp it on. And it literally takes me 15 seconds, and I'm back in business, and the lure is back in the water. I don't need another trolling lead. I don't need any of that stuff, okay? I carry spares of every size. By the way, this is a Dubrow lure and leader keeper. It's the greatest invention since sliced bread. Uh, but nevertheless, I bring spares of every size and I fish four different size lures religiously. And understand this, there is absolutely no variation in what my system is. 
I'm dialed in to an absolute system. And every single time I go out, I do exactly the same thing. I didn't do that from the beginning. It took me dozens and dozens of trips, lots of failures and lots of successes to eventually get to that system. You know, I kind of think about it like I don't follow sports, right? But other than fishing, you got these free throw guys who are amazing at the line in basketball. Is their form not identical every single time? It has to be, right? Their form has to be identical in order for them to be successful. My form is identical in order for me to be successful. The only difference may be the pattern, the color. Do you know what color is best when it comes to wahoo fishing? Doesn't matter. Absolutely, just put it in the water and pull it. Presentation is better. I've caught wahoos on gold, purple, black, pink. I mean, I'm sorry, what bay fish looks like that? What bay fish looks like that? Nothing, but they eat it. They eat it like crazy, okay? It's not the color. And plus what you see is not what the fish sees, right? So we may look at it and go, oh, it's vibrant, blah, blah, blah. And sometimes, yeah, you know, you can have that logic of, hey, I really like a bright color lure or maybe something with a little bit more of a natural pattern. I don't care what you pick. They all work. Okay, all of them, I, I'm telling you hands down. Gold, doesn't matter, they all work. It's more about presentation. So again, getting back to my rigging, just to make sure we understand, 65 pound braid, Alberto knot, 25 feet of 150 pound extra hard leader, right to the little barrel swivel, four foot leader, right to the lure. Okay, very simple, but it's gotta be done right. On the boat, I carry this. This is what I bring with me. In addition to spare lures, okay, extra lures that are already rigged, where all I gotta do is crimp it on, I'll carry a spool of 220 and a spool of 150, <laughs> these coils, okay. Inside here, those are packages of crimps. They're the correct size crimps. There's no guessing, there's no fumbling around, there's no looking for anything. They're in there, ready to go. The 220s, are in here ready to go. There's a little hand crimper. There's a little pair of snips. That's it. I throw it in a bucket and I'm going wahoo fishing. It's that simple and I'm deadly effective. And now if I have to, which I don't, but if I have a problem for whatever reason, my leader gets, who knows, you know, a lot of different things happen out there that we don't expect and I need to put on a new top shot. I've got everything that I need right there. But 99% of the time, the only thing that I ever do is just put on a new lure if my line is chafed up at all. Can you fish cable or wire? Absolutely. Why don't I? Well, I don't because Wahoo are not stupid, okay? They're not stupid. When you are trolling at 14 to 18 knots, high speeding with the trolling leads, those lures are racing through the water so fast there's a lot of white water, there's a lot of commotion that Wahoo doesn't have as much time to evaluate that lure and to determine, I'm gonna smack it, I'm gonna crush it, all right? He's just looking at it, it's escaping, he'll run up and attack it. With the trolling plugs, I'm trolling substantially slower. Sweet spot, 10 knots. To be exact, 10.4, okay? Don't ask me why, 10.4 on my 39 CV powered by triple 400 Verados is the absolute sweet spot. I've caught them from eight to 12. You're in three, four foot seas, you come down to sea, the boat surges forward and suddenly you go 12 knots. You come up and you're doing eight knots. You know what I'm saying, everybody follows me. So you'll catch them in that range. But if I had to pick one number, it's 10.4 knots. So as close as you can get to that 10.4 under any conditions is gonna make a difference. At that speed, the wahoo is swimming up to the lure, okay, and understand that some wahoo strikes are vicious. He will just come out of nowhere, he'll race in, and he'll just try and attack that lure and cut off its tail, its propulsion. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to cut off that bait's tail. The bait then wiggles around, flopping around. He turns around, finishes the job, okay? On other occasions, and trust me, I have studied every single second of underwater Wahoo footage available on the internet all over the planet, 
okay? Every second I have studied. Wahoo will swim up to a lure on many occasions and they'll look at it. They'll literally look at it. They'll study it. They'll look at it. They'll swim from one side, then they'll swim over to the other side, then they'll back off, and then they'll race in, or sometimes they don't race in at all, okay? And if they see that wire, to me, at 10 knots, they have a much greater chance of seeing that wire or cable at that slower speed in cleaner water. Remember, cleaner water. This is no longer being fished in the white water up on top where it's hard to see that cable, right? This is now being fished deeper in the water column where you have clean water. That wahoo could see everything. So to me, anything, anything that I can do to minimize him detecting that this is a fake, I'm going to do it. So mono is a real, real big part of success or of the success that I've been having. I, I really believe that. So all rods are rigged. Now, how do I set my spread, okay, without creating a giant tangle with four lines? Understand that the spread that I'm going to talk to you about right now and how to set it will allow you to do figure eights without getting tangled. Okay? And I know this because I've done it trying to get tangled. Because the only way to know is to know. So you tell me the last time you were out Wahoo fishing and said, you know what? Ah, to hell with it. I hope it doesn't happen, you know? You, you don't do it. Well, I do it. Okay? Because that's my job. That's my living. And I want to know what's going to happen. So I promise you that you will not get tangled. So first and foremost, once I'm out on the Wahoo grounds, Okay, bright and early, it's still the sun hasn't even peeked its head over the horizon yet, and I'm ready to start fishing. I set my boat at 10 knots, the sweet spot, and the first bait that I'm going to set is going to be my far bait. Now my far bait, what I'll call the shotgun bait, doesn't have a lip at all. This is called a Nomad Mad Mac, and I want you to understand something. Contrary to what you may believe, I have absolutely no affiliation with Nomad. They're not one of my sponsors, they're not one of my partners, and I pay the same $50 for this yeah. that you do, okay? Honest to goodness. So this is not about plugging Nomad. What this is about is plugging the absolute best Wahoo lures on the market today, hands down, okay? For various reasons. These are the most durable and effective Wahoo lures that have ever been created or that I've ever fished. And not only me, but certainly anybody else that's experienced these as well. But there's a lot to them. It's not just as easy as tying them on, throwing them back there, and hoping a 50 to 80 pound fish eats it. Like I said, it's all in the details. So the Mad Mac does not have a lip. It's a heavy bait, comes in a variety of different sizes. The 200 is the one that works the best for me. Okay, it's the 200. And this is going to be set way back. This is the first bait that I set. When I say way back, half the spool. Half the spool. It's way back, and then I push the lever forward, the clicker is on, and I put it up on top of my rocket launcher so it is the highest and furthest bait back. It is also the shallowest. This will swim three to five feet below the surface at 10 knots. Okay, three to five feet below the surface at 10 knots. I want you to visualize this entire spread so this way once I'm done walking you through it, you go, oh, oh, that makes sense. He might be on to something, okay? So again, the furthest back, put it up high, get it out of the way, set the drag. You'll look at the rod tip and the rod tip's gonna be going, it's gonna be vibrating like crazy. If that rod tip is not vibrating, there's something wrong with the lure, okay? And understand this, all of these nomads, I gotta tell you, they're like women, they could be temperamental, all right? I'm just telling you that sometimes they just don't wanna cooperate, and it happens. And it could be because the lure is not balanced, it was hit by a fish and got unbalanced. I don't know, it could be something as much as the crimp. There are times you cannot get the lure to perform properly. Get it out of the water. Get it out of the water. Don't say to yourself, oh, you know, I still got three other good ones. No. Get it out of the water, tie on another one, re-rig it, and surprisingly, it'll perform well. Okay, I don't know why. But anyhow, the Mad Mac 200, 
way back, up high, half a spool. What you don't see is deep in these spools, okay, I've got some braid where I've marked a line and done a series of half hitches. Remember what I said about this being a science, okay? Through trial and error, I've got my spread perfected. Now, if I didn't do that, if I didn't mark the line, it's a guessing game. I could be 50 feet or 100 feet or 100 yards off. When you're, we're not talking about letting out 100 feet. When you dump half a spool, you know how much line that is? That's a lot of line. It's very easy to be off. So instead, because it is a science and because I'm trying to set my spread very quickly, all right, and it doesn't matter, you could come fishing with me tomorrow and I could say to you, grab that Mad Mac, let it out till the red mark. Done, okay? I could have three strangers on the boat. We could all set the spread simultaneously, have it set in 60 seconds, and I know it's perfect. I know it's absolutely perfect. So understand that this is a designated set specifically for wahoo fishing, right? You may or may not have that luxury, so to speak. Per, I do, so I've designated, like I said, each rod in a particular position. This does not need to be a bent butt because it's up high and I want it high. And even though you can see it's not much higher than a bent butt, it's still taller, it's still higher. I want it as high as it can be and as far back as it can be. Straight butt works perfect in that scenario. That's bait number one. Anybody have any questions about bait number one? Great. Now, once that is set, we go to bait number two. I'm always setting my lines furthest back, then closest to the boat. Why? If I set a bait right behind the boat, now everything that I'm setting beyond it, I have to go past it. It's dark. Even if it's already light, I risk tangling, right? I risk this lure running into this line or under this line. So you always set from the back coming toward the boat, the furthest one first. Next, I'm gonna take my DTX. I think we're good. 165, this is a Nomad DTX 165. That is the size. This bait will swim five to eight feet below the surface at that same 10 knots. Now I'm gonna tell you, there are reports or claims that some of these nomad lures will swim 50 feet below the surface. Bullshit, okay? They don't swim that deep, okay? I'm telling you, they don't swim that deep, but they do get deep. Nevertheless, the 165, smallest bait, I'm going to set this back 100 feet closer than the Mad Mac. So now we have two baits out. We have our Mad Mac that's three to five feet below the surface, way back there. Now on this corner, I let out my 165, about 100 feet closer. Again, the line is marked, there's no guessing. And this one is now a little bit deeper, five to eight feet. Next, I'm gonna grab a 200. It is the exact same lure, just its bigger brother. It went from 165 to 200, bigger lip. Bigger lip means deeper in the water column. I'm now going to set this one off my starboard corner 100 feet closer than the 165. And this one will swim 10 to 15 feet below the surface. Everybody with me so far? Then finally, I'm gonna take my 220. And this is now the largest, this is called the, the Nomad 220 LRS. LRS standing for Long Range Special. Okay, this lure was designed for all of the long range boats off of San Diego, over at the West Coast. All of the skippers, all of the captains and the crews on those long range boats will tell you that this lure outproduces every other lure six to one. Okay, six to one versus every other wahoo lure that they've ever fished. Do you know why that is? Because it swims the deepest, okay? It swims the deepest. So this final bait, my fourth line, again, the line is marked, is 100 feet closer than my third, and this will swim 15 to 20 feet below the surface. So now picture that. If we took a cross kind of section, my boat's over there, 
I've got my long bait way over there, way, way back there, really high, three to five feet below the surface, 100 feet closer to the boat. I've got my DTX 165, five to eight feet below the surface, my 200, 10 feet or so, 12, 14, something like that below the surface, and then the 220, another 100 feet, 20 feet below the surface. Now, with that particular spread, I literally can make figure eights. Why? Because my far bait is way, way back there. Okay, it's way back there. It's above everything else. I can go in circles. You can watch the line. My deep bait is right there at the end of the wash. Okay, and understand, remember what I said about staggering them 100 feet. But the final DTX 220, that large plug, is not way, way back there. It's right at the end of the white water, deep, deep in the white water. And by the way, this deep bait, largest, closest to the boat, will account for 75% of all of your strikes, okay? 75% of all of them. But you will get bit on all of them, okay, on all of them. Now, why is the not getting tangled important other than the obvious, right? Because can you imagine that tangle of all four of those in one big, oh, boy, I mean, that would be a tangle. I've had that tangle more than once, okay? So I know how bad it is. So it's not where I'm out there doing figure eights because I don't want to do figure eights. I have found that the less you turn when you're fishing these, the more effective you're going to be. I like to troll in a straight line, maybe a very loose S pattern. And the way that I troll, what I do when I'm out here targeting these wahoos, is I'll go from wreck to wreck to wreck to wreck. There's a whole series of wrecks over a 20 mile stretch that range from 130, 140 feet out to 220, 230. I'm going from wreck to wreck to wreck. It's very simple. I'm connecting the dots. That's all I'm doing every single time. It's a system. It's a science. There are times where I'll pick off fish in between spots, and there's a time where I'll pick off fish literally as I'm going right over the wreck, the rod just starts singing. So Wahoo, unlike snapper and grouper, they're not wreck or structure oriented, but they like to eat. They like to eat what? Bonitas, jacks, blue runners, basically anything. Little black fins, flying fish, sardines, and all of these other bait fish, the forage does associate with structure, does associate with wrecks. So I want to go where dinner is being served, or breakfast, I should say, okay, not dinner. So in turn, that's my system. It's not, let me get out there and, hey, where do I go? What do I do? No, I've got a game plan in mind. I go out there, the boat's put up the speed, the spread is set in seconds, and then it's very easy. Wreck to wreck to wreck. And in two hours, after covering 20 miles, if I have not had a single bite, there are no wahoo around. There are no wahoo around. If there are wahoo around, you're going to get bites. As long as you do it right, you're going to get bites. However, getting bites is only half the battle right, is getting bit is only half the battle. Because now, of course, you have to land that fish while still having all of these other lines behind the boat. Now, understand that there is a big advantage to the trolling plugs versus the trolling leads and the high-speed variation of Wahoo fishing that we talked about earlier. The advantage is that even at three knots, this is still swimming. It's still fishing, okay? It's still swimming. So there's a number of occasions where you'll be fighting a fish. The boat is still moving forwards, right? Because you absolutely want to keep that forward momentum. So this is still swimming, and suddenly you're fighting a fish, and the rod just goes pow and starts singing. And you got another one on, okay? And now you've got a double on. So absolutely expect that to happen because the lure, like I said, is still fishing, okay? Now, I just mentioned forward momentum. This is an important factor. We've all seen, including, you know, or have done it, experienced it, or seen it, your high-speed wahoo fishing with the trolling leads, you get a fish on, they practically never slow the boat down. 
10 knots, 14, I mean, 14 knots, 15, the boat is still flying, and that's why they use the electric reels, because you can't reel in a 30, 40, 50 pound Wahoo with the boat moving at 50 miles an hour, I mean, at, you know, 15 miles an hour. But you certainly can push a button, and that motor can bring them in, okay? And they want to continue that forward momentum because you have a large three pound lead pulling that hook out of that fish's mouth. And if you don't keep that forward momentum, it's very easy to pull hooks on the wahoos. Well, remember, with this system, I don't have that trolling lead. That's out of the equation altogether. So I'm now fighting the fish directly. It's from rod tip to fish. So I don't have to have that same momentum moving forward. Do I want to keep the boat moving forward? Absolutely. Absolutely. So when you get bit, resist the urge to put that boat in neutral. On the contrary, fight it. Don't put the boat in neutral. I've got 18,000 miles of line on here. 65 pound braid, I'm not going to get spooled. So when I start, you know, when I get bit and a reel is singing, just let it go for a minute. Let it go. Understand what is happening. You're not going to get spooled. The fish is hooked. Okay. Evaluate what's happening. If my deep bait got hit, I'm okay because all of the other ones are behind it. I don't need to worry about the other ones. They're generally behind it unless the fish, of course, has you know run and the boat's continuing to move forward. But I don't have to worry about those. However, if my shotgun bait gets hit, now I'm like, okay, I need to think about this because I've got three other baits in between the fish and me. And there is no doubt that I'm gonna tangle. Right? There's no doubt. So I do. I slow down. And you know what the first thing I do is? It's not fight the fish. He's still hooked. He's not going anywhere. The boat's continuing to move forward. I start to clear my other lines as fast as I can. That's when a two-speed reel really comes in handy because reeling this through the water is not so easy when the boat's moving forward at any rate of speed. So you've really got to be on your toes. I don't clear anything unless I absolutely have to. I try to avoid at all costs clearing anything because I want my lures to continue to be in the water, to continue to be fishing, okay? And it's just so much work, right? Reeling all of those up, especially from that far away. But it's worth it when one of your rods is going, teeny, it's bouncing like this, and you know you got a wahoo on there. It's, all, it's gonna be a wahoo. There's very other few fish that are going to eat that bait. Big king mackerel, not terribly uncommon. A big black fin tuna, not terribly uncommon. Every now and then a big dolphin or a sailfish, not terribly common at all. But all great, the bycatch is all great. But 90 plus percent of the time, when you get bit on one of these trolling plugs, it's going to be a wahoo, okay? And you know it instantly because the rod's gonna go pow, pow. It's gonna bounce just like this. Okay, every single time it's gonna bounce like this. That's that wahoo, he ate it, he's shaking his head, he's trying to go in a different direction. Now it's very important that you keep that forward momentum because there is one downside to these lures. And that's, in my opinion, the hooks that they put on them. These are BKK or BBK or some brand like that. And while it's a really good, strong hook, I mean, you can tow a truck with this hook, it has almost no barb. Very, very, very small barb. Very small barb. And I'm not gonna lie to you, I've pulled the hook on too many fish that I blame on this hook. So I've started to switch out all of the hooks on all of my plugs. It's not easy to find an 11-0 hook like that. VMC is the only one that has it. Gamakatsu, owner, Mustad, nobody makes an inline hook that big. You can find a southern style tuna hook with a welded eye, okay, or a welded ring that you could potentially put on there. But if you want to duplicate that inline hook, because remember, if you kind of notice that, well, I guess that's a better way to do it. These hooks run in line with the lure, okay? They run in line with it. If the hook was sideways, it would be creating too much turbulence. The lure would be out of balance. It will wobble, it will spin, and it will come out of the water. So it was specifically designed for the lures 
I mean, for the hooks to be tucked in and to run in line with the lure. So you can't just replace this hook with another hook that has the eye in a different orientation because you will not get the same effect from the lure. So you're trolling along, you get bit, one of the reels starts singing, you are so excited, you're hooked up, you've got them on. You've resisted the urge to pull those throttles back until you've really taken a look behind the boat and said, okay, I know what I need to do here. Now understand in my particular case, I've been fishing for 40, I just turned 51 the other day, 47 years. Wow. For 47 years. For me, it's now about challenges. To go out solo and to catch Wahoo by myself, it's not because I don't have any friends or anybody you know, to fish with, it's because I like that challenge. It's an incredible challenge, it's like an adrenaline rush for me to be able to come back with a fish or two fish, which by the way, the limit on Wahoo is two per person, okay? And to do it all on your own is just such a thrill to me, that's why I do it. But it requires a tremendous amount of focus, you know, determination, and understanding you're going to lose some fish. You know, I was out last week, two trips, like the one trip I was talking about where I lost that fish, I lost another fish that trip as well, and had two short bites. What do I mean by a short bite or a short strike? You'll be trolling along and suddenly the reel will go, I guess maybe we can, it'll go and stop. And you're like, oh, how'd he miss it? How'd he miss it? They miss it. You know, sometimes they just don't get the hooks in them or they get the hooks in them because they hit it sideways and the hook is just right on the side of their mouth and it skates off. A lot of different things can happen. So you are absolutely not going to hook every wahoo bite that you get, okay? And out of all of the bites that you get, you're not going to land every wahoo that you hook. It's just not gonna happen. It's not that easy, nor should it be. You should work for it, okay? Because they are that glamorous of a fish and they are that worthwhile to catch. Nevertheless, remember what I said about the gaffs. I have one on each side. I'm not fumbling around. I am ready. I'm ready for this battle. This could, you could be by yourself on the boat or you could be with the whole crew on the boat. It makes no difference. The same goal now has to be achieved. We have to get that fish from out there into there, okay? No matter what, no matter who's on the boat. So slow it down. I know you're excited, but pay attention to what's going on with the other lines. Make whatever adjustments that you need to in order to keep this fish away from those lines. You may have to turn the boat, all right? If the fish is on this side, this is the back of my boat, we're moving in this direction, okay? I'm now looking off the stern, the fish is over here. He hit this bait, the 200. He's not over here, he's over here. If I'm thinking I'm gonna get tangled, all I have to do is turn the boat, okay? And now the fish is gonna be out here. So you need to understand the mobility of your boat and how to maneuver your boat correctly in order to avoid that fish crossing with the other lines. This is where, remember, I'm gonna go back when I said I'm not out there doing figure eights when I'm trolling for Wahoo, so I don't care about that. This is where I care about it. This is why it's so important that my spread doesn't tangle because when I am fighting fish, I'm making hard turns, okay, in order to land that fish and trying to avoid all of my other lines. That's why it's important to me that nothing tangle. I'm fighting the fish. Keep in mind, I fish a very, I don't want to say a very tight drag, but a relatively tight drag. When you are trolling at 10 knots, and you're pulling this big lip plug through the water, this drag is tight. If it's not tight, you're gonna get what we call line creep. The line is gonna just slowly creep off the reel. And now my entire spread is demolished because every position is now jeopardized. So I wanna make sure that my lure stays in the correct position. How do I know if I have line creep? I'm at the wheel, I turn around, and how do I know? I just look at the reels and right here I have a red mark, red mark, red mark, red mark, right? That I put on the line. It's a, an indicator to me. And I go, they're right there, they're perfect. Or, oh man, the red mark's gone. It's gone. Where is it? 
I now, if I want to readjust this lure into the right position, I put it in low gear and hand over hand while the boat's continuing to move forward at the same rate of speed, and I can just pull it up until that red line is right where I need it to be. Okay, it's a system, it's a science. It's easy once you get dialed in. Understand that these drags, it's not set it and forget it. There are constantly different things happening. There, it's very rare, although awesome, when you can go out there, set your drags, and it's calm, which by the way, there's no question that I find I'm having far greater success when there's two feet or less than when it's rougher fishing this spread, okay? If you have three to five foot seas, go do something else. Unless you're forced to wahoo fish, go do something else. They bite far better when it's calmer. I just believe everything is more stable, more streamlined, you know, there's no fluctuations and you don't even have to mess with your drag. Those occasions are rare, but when they happen, cherish them. Other than those occasions, Constantly, I am constantly checking my drag. Drags have a mysterious way of adjusting themselves, okay? Where you put it in one position, but suddenly it's tighter or looser. It just happens, okay? It does. So literally, I mean, I'm probably fanatical about it. Easily every five minutes, I'm back there just pulling. And keep in mind, people say, do you set your drag by, you know, with the scale? I don't because I'm constantly making adjustments. So what am I gonna do, pull out a scale every time? I'm not that guy. I do it by feel. And how do I know what that feel is? I want that drag set as tight as it can be without the line creeping off the reel in those conditions. And the conditions change. I'm trolling at 10 knots down current. The current is behind me. It's pushing me. I'm moving this way. At 10 knots, my drag is set. I turn around and I now come back this way. There's two knots of current, okay? I'm now moving this way at what speed? Eight, okay? If I wanna push it back up to 10 and I push the throttles up, I'm now moving in this direction at the same 10 knots. But guess what? The velocity, the resistance on the lure is 12 knots because I'm now going into the current. So that same drag setting that I would have when I'm going down sea at 10 knots is not the same drag setting as when I'm going either up sea or into the current. So it's a constant game of adjusting. You always have to adjust, okay? It's not set it and forget it. When I get a fish on, the reel is singing. Before I even pull the throttles back, one of the things that I do is I'll back off on the drag. Okay, I back off on the drag. I don't go, of course, into free spool and I don't do a really light drag, but I absolutely back off on it because there was a tremendous amount of tension and I'm afraid of pulling that hook out of that fish. I'm not afraid of them shaking the hook out, but I'm afraid of pulling the hook out. Wahoo have a really bony, we'll call it a beak, but it's not a beak, right? A really bony jaw but there are spots on the sides where it's real soft. And if you don't bury that hook in there, it's easy for that hook to come out. So I will back off on the drag a little bit once we're fighting that fish. I then pull the throttles back. Okay, the boat is still moving forward. I'm not gonna go into neutral. If I do go into neutral for any reason, you better be conscious or you better understand what direction the wind and the current are moving in. Because using the same scenario we just talked about, if I'm going in this direction, north, right here, okay, and the current is behind me, if I put the boat in neutral, I don't have to concern myself with the other lines back there because the boat's going this way, right? Away from the lures. But if I turn the boat this way and put the boat into neutral, What's gonna happen? I'm going to literally drift over my lines and that's how you get a really big tangle. Okay, really big, 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 big mess. Okay, keep that in mind. So understand what the conditions are doing at all times. While you were out there wahoo fishing, don't set your spread and just forget about what's going on. Set your spread and pay attention to everything. 
everything. Remember what I said, I'm constantly monitoring my screens. I've got a pair of stabilized binoculars on the dash. I'm looking not only at what I see in every direction, but every time I see another boat, you know, not, I mean, another boat wahoo fishing, I'm also looking at them. Okay, just to see what they're doing, how they're doing it, how many lines they're pulling, where they are, what speed they're going. I just like information. I like to just digest it all. It helps me fine tune my approach. Nevertheless, I'm fighting that fish. I now get them up next to the boat. My gaffs are handy. Remember that I could fight that fish to within four feet of the rod tip. So he's right there. I've got a long gaff. It's right there, ready to go. The fish is laying right there. I gaff them. Okay, immediately reel goes into free spool. We're not into free spool, but I back off on the drag. Rod goes into the rod holder, and then I can worry about getting that fish up into the boat. And remember what I said, when I hook that giant 80 to 100 pounder, I'm gonna reach for that third gaff that's right in the middle. Because I don't wanna be the guy who stands up here and telling you a story about the day where I hooked a 100 pound Wahoo, but couldn't get them in the boat, okay? So once I do get that fish in the boat, immediately, immediately the throttles get pushed back up because I still have three more baits in the water. And I just caught a Wahoo there, so it's not uncommon for there to be other fish in the area. Understand I'm trying to be as efficient as I possibly can. I don't want to get grass on my leader, on my swivel. I don't want to fumble around with lures that are not swimming properly. All of this makes a difference because prime time Wahoo is 7 a.m. to 9 a.m., okay? It's not that you can't catch them any other time of the day. In my opinion, my humble opinion, I'm gonna tell you that Wahoo and certainly 98% of all Wahoo that I've ever caught have had zero in their stomachs, okay? Has anybody ever caught a Wahoo that had something in its stomach that it recently ate? And you may say yes, because I have too, but in a numbers game, 90% of the Wahoo you catch will be empty. What does that tell you? That tells me that not only am I going out there to try and find a fish, I'm going out there to try and find a fish that hasn't eaten breakfast yet. Because once he eats breakfast, he's not eating my breakfast, because he just ate breakfast, okay? And how do I know that? Because if they kept eating like dolphin, we know, right, with dolphin, you rip open a dolphin, oh my God, he's got half the ocean in his stomach. He's got his little brother in his stomach, okay? For, really. So in turn, it's not the same. It's a different animal altogether. And yes, there are gonna be occasions where you'll catch fish that do have something else in their stomach. It's not 100%, but certainly 90% of the Wahoo that you catch will be empty. So to me, I wanna find that fish and get him while he's looking for breakfast. Except for that worm. Except for those worms. Now, what he's mentioning is inside Wahoo, again, all of them have parasites in their stomach. They have these two little worms. They got a funky name. It almost looks like a snail out of its shell. Don't get freaked out when you're filleting a wahoo and you see these two little alien-like creatures come out of its stomach. Totally harmless. Just they don't affect the flesh and it doesn't bother the fish in any way whatsoever. Um, but getting back to it, again, I'm going out there at that prime time trying to catch the fish that haven't eaten breakfast yet because I want them to eat my breakfast, okay? So that prime time is real important. By nine o'clock, if I don't find them, I'm either one of two things, as I said, I'm either going home because my Wahoo trip is over. I'm certainly, if I didn't catch them from seven to nine, from six to nine, I'm not gonna catch them from nine to 12. Right? It's very unlikely that that's gonna happen. So I'll give it to two or three hours in the morning, and then it's either I pull the plug and I'm back to the dock, or we could go mutton snapper fishing or something else if we chose to do that as well, and there's times that we'll do that. We'll generally start every mutton snapper trip wahoo fishing, because we're not gonna be mutton snapper fishing at 6 a.m., even though I've done that as well. You know, we like to give it a little bit of time to warm up, so it's a great way to start every trip, or it's a great way to just stay really focused. Finally, once that fish is up in the boat, and obviously you've got them on ice, back at the fillet table, 
fillet that wahoo, cut them into bite-sized pieces, dip those bite-sized pieces into flour and then scrambled egg and then panko, seasoned panko breadcrumbs. Dip them in really hot oil for about 30 to 60 seconds. They will become incredibly crispy little nuggets. Drizzle a little sweet and sour or like Thai chili sauce on top of them and a little bit of yum yum sauce. Pick one up, take a bite, say I love you Mike. Okay? <laughs> That's our seminar for tonight, guys. Thank you very, very much. And then we're gonna go ahead and do our raffle real quick.